these are not real high numbers. And to get a robust economy that's going to grow at a, a, at least a trend at 2%, we need that number to be higher. We need the curve to get steeper. Well, here is something we haven't seen for a while. The 30-year Treasury and the two-year Treasury yield curve steepening at a much quicker pace than a lot of the other yield curves. So we're talking about a bear steepener here, Joe. Explain what that is and what it means in terms of a weaker dollar, since we seem to be in that category, too. Okay. Well, a bear steepener, uh, the bear part of steepener or flattener, generally refers to what's happening to the long end of the curve. So when you say bear steepener, it means that the yield curve is steepening, meaning that the wide, that the, the spread between the two-year and the 30-year is getting wider. Now, in this case, the two-year has actually been falling, but the 30-year yield has been rising, which means that you are, if you're a, an owner of that bond, you're losing money. It's a bearish setup. So what does it mean in, in the context of a weaker dollar? I think what it says uh, is that th those things are related to some degree, I think, because uh, a weaker dollar is, in, in fact, the definition of inflation. Look, uh, everybody gets this confused, right? They, they look at the CPI and the CPI and, the, and the, all these other price indexes that we use, PCE and so forth, and they're looking at prices, but prices are not inflation. Prices are the effect of inflation. Inflation is actually a loss of purchasing power, which means uh, a drop in the value of your money. So when we talk about a weak dollar environment, in a sense, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about inflation. We're talking about a loss of purchasing power. Now, the dollar index, just so everybody understands, is, a, is not an absolute value of the dollar. It's a relative value of the dollar. It is the dollar relative to other currencies. When we look, though, at other items, particularly gold, uh, which has been money for thousands of years until, I don't know, roughly 1972, <laughs> um, until then. Uh, so, it, it, you know, gold, it, it, when you measure the value of the dollar versus gold, it's obvious that gold has gone up a bunch. You can say gold's gone up a bunch. You can say the dollar's gone down a bunch, either way you want to look at it. But the dollar, is, it, it's kind of interesting, actually, that... In, in that view of the world, the dollar has been weak already. And so the idea that it's weak now is just means that it's weaker than the other currencies that are out there. Um, look, I, I don't want to overplay this. Uh, you know, it, it's very interesting when you look at yield curves in general, whether you're looking at the 32 or the 10-2 or the 10-3 month, it, it doesn't matter. One of the most interesting things that's going on with yield curves is that the steepness of the curve at the peak has gotten lower, successively lower. In other words, what I mean is if you go back and look, uh, and I'm going to just go and pull this up. If you look at the 30-year, two-year curve, the peaks back in, say, the the uh, in the 90s, uh, in the 90s and the 2000s, and even in, in, after the great financial crisis, those spread, the max spread was over 3%. Uh, the spread actually in, in after uh, the, the great financial crisis in 2011, it got up to 4%. So. So now when we came out of COVID, and what that means is, look, a, a steeper yield curve is associated with higher nominal growth in the future. That's what it's associated with. And you could say not, not higher real growth, too. It depends on how you look at these things, but it doesn't matter. The point is it means more growth. So when that peak is not as high, it means that your peak growth is not going to be as high. Or you're ultimately what we're talking about is a, an economy that's not performing as it has in the past. So when we look at that three or three to four percent peak in previous uh, coming out of previous recessions, well, the peak coming out of uh, out of 2020 out of the COVID recession was only a little over two, and right now the spread's only a little over one. So these are not real high numbers, and to get a robust economy that's going to grow at a, a at least a trend at two percent, we need that number to be higher. We need the curve to get steeper. Now. We need it to get steeper because of real growth and not just nominal growth, because it could just end up being inflation. And that's what concerns me. Um, I, I don't know. Obviously, we can't predict the future, so I don't know how that's going to work out. But I do know that this yield curve, where it is now, doesn't say a lot of good things about future growth. Steve, um, if you translate those things Joe said from 
economy to market, what does that mean in the in the investing world? Well, I mean, we have our um, um, DARP, our um, dollar rates paradigm, right? That's a big thing we look at. So th these are big things. I mean, for us, but I think also it impacts the market. And one of the things it means is that if you're all in on uh, the S&P 500 and treasuries, you might want to rethink that um, because this this trend's kind of going in a direction that really want, makes you want to look at other assets. Um, it also means that if you've got commodities, including precious metals exposure, you, you, you might want to keep that and let, the, let those run. Um, it means we're looking at foreign stocks more. Um, but, but the simple recipe of buy U.S. growth stocks, uh, as Joe's pointing out, there might be some, some U.S. growth problems here. Um, the idea that, you know, um, since 82, you really had the wind at your back in terms of buying bonds because rates were continually going down and you really had a great bond bull market. Well, that might not be here anymore. So you might be in a fundamentally different investing environment. Uh, and you should really kind of re-examine your portfolio with the eye to what, what's worked, um, in, in, for much of your investing lifetime. Um, certainly, um, for the more recent years. Um, heading up to COVID uh, might not be what's going to work in the future. Um, so it's an argument for diversification. It actually might also be an argument for some active management and um, resizing some positions and some bets. So that's a long discussion. We'll kind of get into that. But I also want to point out here too that we might not have like stagflation around the corner or a growth falling off or the dollar still overvalued. But, but what's kind of worrisome here is the trends. Um, and that's a big thing you pay attention to in investments. So yeah, I, I, you know, uh, the dollar's still overvalued here, uh, but it's off its peak. It, it's you know, I, I kind of key in at that on the Dixie that that 100 level. Um, you know, we were thinking that we might uh, get a counter rally here, maybe kind of even retest uh, that high uh, you got in May that was around 102. Um, there's a good argument here that you know kind of retesting that that 100 level that went from resistance to support might be all you got because now we're trading below that 50 day uh the, the trend this year has, has really been towards dollar weakness now, i will say technical analysis really really works best with hindsight that, that, that's the easiest way to recognize patterns um with it um but now we're getting some more hindsight with it and it's easier to call and it, it, that dow trend is looking more and more confirmed with the more hindsight we get not that it couldn't go the other way and you you know those weren't real patterns you were looking at with some hindsight um but we're we're looking at some fundamental analysis too here uh and not just why the dollars were valued but policy and there's a lot of reasons that multi-year cycles um you know and, and that's inflationary um if, if your currency is buying less and again uh, it's still overvalued it's still at a pretty high level but the trend's not your friend here <laughs> Um, if, if you're looking towards purchasing power for the dollar. Um, and I'd say the same thing with, with the worries here on what the long end and the short end of the curve are doing. I'm not maybe super worried about um, us uh, waking up tomorrow and there being uh, gas lines and uh, bell bottoms and disco balls all around. Um, but the trend's not the friend. And, and it's something I think to keep an eye on and be worried that, as Joe mentioned, um, we're not getting uh, the growth you really want and um and and long end of the curve is telling you a story that like a, a lot of that growth might not um be real growth it might be more inflationary so so things to keep an eye on you know joe all this year you've talked about the trend with the dollar and you anticipate i mean we went from i think it was around 109 the end of january dropped down to 96 and you anticipated a rally which we got but where are we now yeah, well, Steve's kind of talking about that. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of feeble, <laughs> I guess is a good way to put it. You got to rally just because you were oversold. You know, when I look at uh, the futures markets and the, the positioning uh, there, I don't see any big extremes in any direction, actually, to tell you the truth. Uh, so nobody's making any big bets in the currency markets these days. It's kind of interesting. Uh, and I think that's probably <laughs> probably a wise position. Uh, considering all the uh, the various news coming out of Washington D.C. on a daily basis, um, I will tell you that you know the, one of the reasons the dollar has been weak over the last week and a half or so uh, is this talk from uh, from a lot of people in the administration about wanting lower interest rates. 
and now uh, appointing uh, Myron to the board and hoping he gets approved in time to vote in September and so forth. And I will tell you, um, I, I've been doing this for almost uh, 35 years now, and I have never, ever, ever seen a Treasury Secretary talk as openly about monetary policy as this one has. Uh, he was actually uh, quoted uh, in, in Bloomberg this morning as saying that the Fed should be considering not just a 50 basis point hike, but that the rate should be 150 basis points lower. Uh, that's a percent and a half for those of you who don't work in basis points. Uh, that would be taking it from the four and a quarter where it is now, four and a quarter, four and a half down, you know, a, a, a percent and a half. I mean, you've taken it under three. That's freaking nuts. Uh, well, maybe not nuts, but it's not... Uh, it's it's not in line with the with the real world. It's interesting too that he said in this in this interview that all the models out there say that rates should be at least 150 basis points lower. And I have to tell you, I've been doing this a long, long time, guys. I know what the models are that get used to come up with these numbers to figure out what Fed funds should be. I'm going to give you a clue right now that it is there's not a model I know of that says rates should be 150 basis points lower. I actually did the calculation this morning for what's known as the Taylor Rule. The Taylor Rule says that uh, rates should be somewhere between four and an eighth and 5%. Well, guess what? We're at four and a quarter to four and a half, so it's just about where it's supposed to be. Uh, this idea that there are economic models out there that says rates should be that much lower is just to, let me just put a little fine point on it, it's bullshit. <laughs> And so uh, I don't know where they get this, but they're pushing hard for lower rates and lower rates are not going to be positive for the dollar, uh, especially when you look at the differential. When you think about Japan, for instance, Japan has got a little bit of an inflation problem. Bank of Japan is going to continue to, to hike rates. That rate differential is going to drive uh, money into uh, it, it's going to drive the dollar down. So now the yen is not as big a weight in the dollar index as the euro is. So it's going to take more juice with the yen to really push the dollar down, but uh, I, you might get it. Look, I don't know what's going to happen with rates. I, I can tell you that that if you if you got them 150 basis points from where they are right now, if you did that in September, I think that would be I, I think that 30 year would be headed higher again. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I, it's actually kind of odd to tell you the truth. Why is the administration pushing so hard for interest rate cuts right now when normally? We're looking for interest rate cuts when the economy is weak, but they're out there saying that the economy is great, but we need to cut rates. Uh, those things don't make sense. Anyway, look, the dollar is in a downtrend, uh, and I would actually say, you know, it's been a gentle downtrend. But if you think about it, we made that high of one fifteen, at one fourteen and three quarters back in twenty twenty two. We made a subsequent high around one ten uh, earlier this year. That's a lower high. In technical analysis, uh, since Steve was talking about that, that's that's a bearish trend. Now, they're three years apart, but still, it is a, a kind of a, a downtrend since that peak in 2022, uh, and it has accelerated this year. So I, I don't think you should expect the uh, a, you know a rapid fall in the dollar, uh, but if you start seeing big interest rate cuts like uh, Besson is talking about, then you may get it, but... Uh, for now, I think you got to just assume that the dollar trend is down and you need to act accordingly. And uh, it affects what you do in your portfolio, as Steve said. We can talk about that sometime. What does a weak dollar portfolio look like? Uh, in general, the things that we're seeing this year uh, should give you a clue. Go and take a look and see what uh, international stocks, how they perform versus the U.S. this year. That gives you a clue what you ought to be doing. Investing in this environment requires great research and a great process. We have both. If you'd like some help with your portfolio, let us know at info at alhambrapartners.com.